Welcome to Sam's Business Growth Show. I'm Sam Dunning, a digital marketing, sales, and business growth evangelist. Tune in and subscribe today as I'll be interviewing business leaders, experts, and entrepreneurs from around the globe. You'll be learning their story, how digital marketing has helped them along the way, and exclusive tips and insights to help you skyrocket your own business. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to a fresh episode of Sam's Business Growth Show. Excited to be joined by the UK's most hated sales trainer, Benjamin Dennehy, returning to the show before we hit 100 episodes. Benjamin, welcome back, man. It's nice to chat to you today. How are you doing? Hey, good. Yeah, it's uh, good to be back. Good to see you, Sam. You're looking well? Feeling it, feeling good, man. How's um, how's it been for you since we last spoke? How's business going well? Business is good. Yes, uh, COVID has been one of those blessings in disguise. So, um, uh, yeah, I've been very, very fortunate. Uh, I know a lot of people haven't, um, but, you know... <sighs> it's the way it goes but uh, no for me business has been very good actually no complaints decent decent yeah i've, I've been seeing through your posts that things are going well in terms of the training everything moving virtual mm. so it's, yeah re really pleased to hear it man and yeah, it's looking for <laughs> cool looking forward to um yeah an exciting topic for many today um mm. as most of us i'm i'm not ashamed to say the the main reason i put so much content out through LinkedIn, through YouTube, through the blog, and through all of our channels of web choice that we're on, be it SEO, be it paid ads and such. Um, but the main focus of getting new clients, getting inbound leads, people that want to do business with us, they give us a call, send us an email, or perhaps if we're on LinkedIn or a social channel, they, they drop us a message saying, look, can you perhaps help with that, this, or I'm thinking about doing this, or I've got an issue with this, can you help? So, yeah, I'm not, not ashamed to say I'm, I'm in it for the inbound leads, as are many of us um, in business. We want, we want to generate more revenue. We want to generate more, generate more cast, customers. And that usually starts with a lead, whether it's outbound or in this case, that today's co topic is inbound leads. So I want to talk all about how we can how we can close them, um, how we can not get stuck in voicemail jail, the endless going back and forth of chasing, of nudging people on email over the phone, which, which really just pisses people off because you're not really getting anywhere. And it's just kind of stuck in your sales pipeline. So it'd be great if we could start from the top then. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of, lot of questions we'll have in terms of um, best ways to, to manage it, um, as I'm guilty of many of these things as well. But it'd be awesome if we could have a step-by-step -step process of um, turning our hard-earned hard leads, because we all know how hard it is to actually generate the lead in the first place, into, um, into revenue. Or, more, or equally as important, I'm sure you agree, is qualifying them out fast. So... Um, Perhaps we could look at it from um, a message standpoint, or it doesn't necessarily matter if someone's dropped us a message or sent us an email saying, look, we're interested in, in your help in this. What should be our first response, Ben? Should we go straight for a call or what should we do? Well, the first thing any salesman needs to do uh, when he gets an inbound lead is look in the mirror and say, don't get emotionally attached, you loser. Yeah. You see, the problem is, is salespeople are too emotionally involved in what they do. So if you spend a lot of time and money trying to generate inbound leads, you get a little bite. And the first thing is you get all excited. Oh, this, this must be an opportunity. This is good. They're contacting us. And there's this assumption that if someone contacts you, they actually want what you have. But that's total rubbish. We know from our own buying experience. We often contact people, companies, or individuals with no intention of actually buying. We're just exploring. We're uh, intellectually curious. So in order to avoid getting sucked into satisfying someone's mere intellectual curiosity, the first thing they need to do is not get emotional. So if you get an inbound lead, don't get excited. When I get an email or a message via LinkedIn or via email, the first thing I think to myself is, oh, God, it's a tire kicker. That's uh, the first thing. So rather than get excited, it's the exact opposite. It's, ah, uh, this will be a tire kicker. Everyone wants to have a virtual chat, which is code for I want to steal as much information from you as I can for free under the guise of having some interest in potentially working with you. So the first thing a salesman has to do is get out of their own way. Stop getting excited. You know, a lawyer doesn't get excited every time the phone rings or an ambulance goes by. Because, oh, it's an opportunity. Yeah. So stop it. That's the first thing I would say. So I don't know if you have any feedback. I, I was going to say, I've, I've fallen at the first hurdle there, Ben, because quite often if I get a LinkedIn message, I'm thinking, oh, a fresh lead. Or there if I get go. an email, if someone's um, inquired through our website, one of our landing pages or one of our forms, I see that yeah. pop up. 
on my phone perhaps or if I'm on the computer like oh an inquiry's coming lads let's let's get onto this so yeah I I'm definitely guilty of, of, of the first hurdle um I'm not saying don't respond quickly I'm saying don't get excited that is a yeah. um that is an no, emotional that's... thing and I don't want you to get ex- I want you to be extremely skeptical because 85 percent of inbound leads are rubbish it's people literally fishing for something. Um, I, I wrote about this recently. So uh, in our previous life, many, many years ago, uh, as a lawyer, one of the things I learned was um, that there is a difference between committing a crime, attempting com- to commit a crime, and preparing to commit a crime. Now, it's a crime to shoot your mother-in-law. It is a crime to try and shoot your mother-in-law and miss. That's an attempt. But it's not a crime to buy the gun. And that's preparing to commit the crime. Now, things have changed with the world of terrorism. There's preparing terrorism offences. But the average offence, if you're just preparing to commit it, you're not committing a crime. So buying the gun, buying the bullets, perhaps even planning out the route you're going to take to get to a house, and the police arrest you as you're coming out your front door, the courts would say, well, he hasn't actually done anything wrong yet. He's just prepared. So a lot of prospects are preparing. They're trying to make a decision on whether or not they should actually make a decision. So they go through this fishing exercise, and it often starts with, I'm really very interested in what it is that you do. I'd love to have a chat. Yeah, That yeah. just means I have no idea what and the We've all heard it. Happen. We've all heard it. All right. Yeah. So step one, don't get emotionally attached. Don't get emotionally um, attached. Don't yeah. don't start chucking it in your pipeline, thinking the business is closed no. before you've even asked any questions. No. Um <laughs> no. All right, so we've 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 not got excited. We've, we've we'll say it's a given that we're going to respond fast because we all know the stats that, that add up. That if you if you respond to leads in in good time, your your conversion rate is going to going to go up. So we've responded it too quickly. Let's say we've we've um we've got them onto a call. Are there any? Because we've we've heard from there's there's all kinds of different sales trainers, um, business advice gurus, whatever that give you different kind of openers, Ben. Yeah. Um, and I've heard many over the years, like. Give me an what example. Pro- yeah, I'd like to. Yeah, what what motivated you to reach out to us today? That's that's quite a commonly used one when ah, you first speak awesome to someone. <laughs> so what? Why is that bad, Ben? And what do you suggest we we open up a conversation? It doesn't with? help push. Doesn't help push things forward. Mm. So if somebody contacts me, say I phone them because we've agreed to speak, or they phone me, or we email each other and agree to talk. The first, after a bit of chit chat, you know, there's always a bit of human social bonding and interaction. But the first question I will always ask them, okay, well, look, before we begin, what do you want to have happen by the end of this call? If your suspect doesn't know where they want to go, well, I got to find that out in the first few seconds. Now, the answer to that question is always 99% of the time it is exactly the same and it is in some form or deviation of what I'm about to say. If you ask someone, what would you like to have happen by the end of this call? They always say, I'm just interested in understanding a little bit more about what it is that you do and whether or not you're relevant to working with us. It's all, It's something that vague. Or I just want to get a quote. I want you to send me a proposal, compare prices. Yeah, well, fine. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want you to get a quote. Okay, fine. So if someone said to me oh, they want a quote, I'd say, well, why do you want a quote? Okay. Uh, because we're getting three quotes. Okay, and what are you going to do with the three of them? Uh, well, we're then going to consider them, yeah, and you're going to go with the lowest one, aren't you? So what are they going to say? They're going to say yes or You'd no. Imagine yes. Yeah, so I could go <laughs> on how this conversation goes, so I'm just going to yeah. challenge them. But most okay. people say they say the quote. Say they say, I just want to understand a little bit more about what it is that you do. I go, fair enough. That makes sense. And assuming you hear what you want to hear, what happens next? Oh, and now, 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 now they've got to, well, uh, well, then I guess, what well, would we meet? Uh, would you do me a proposal? Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, you start to realize they don't really know where they want to go. And I go, that's, that's fine. I understand it. And then I tell them what's going to happen. Well, why don't we agree this? And then I tell them what's going to happen. By the end of this call, three things are going to happen. Either you're going to form the opinion I'm not someone you want to move forwards with, and in which case we can say no to each other. Or I'm going to come to the conclusion I can't help you based on the answers you're going to give on this phone call. And if that's the case, 
And then I'll tell you no. Are you okay with that? And everybody says yes. And then finally, if neither of us say no to each other, we'll have to agree a next step. Are you okay with that? And everyone says, well, yes, of course. Okay, well, I'll tell you what that next step is because I've only got one in my world. Your job is to control the process. I'm not here to learn how to sell to you. You're here to learn how to buy off of me. Remember, you're the one with the problem. You called me. I don't need my services. I've got a warehouse full of my services. So it's about you maintaining control. And you tell them what the next step in your world is. Now, if you don't know that, you're an idiot. You need to know what that is. If it's, ah, well, we'll come and do a pretty... No, you need to know what your next step is. Now, if your next step is do a quote, my question would be, how can you do a quote based on a quick 10-minute conversation? You can't. So the next step would have to be something more substantive, a more substantive discovery call, perhaps. Hmm. I gotcha. don't know. It depends what you sell. And obviously, there's no one fit size next step for all. But depending on what you sell, there is always a clear next step. And that next step has to be a commitment that by the end of this call, we'll either say, no, there is no point doing that next step. Or actually, based on this conversation, doing that next step makes sense. So you need to know what it is and you need to know how to get them to the point to say, you're right. We should probably do the next step. That's that, nice. that that's that's that, that's it in a nutshell. And but the reason why salespeople don't do that is they're scared that the person will say, "But I don't like the next step." Well, it's tough. <laughs> and that's that's the point I was going to get to, Ben. Um, I struggled yeah. this in in my younger days um, of thinking that when I say these kind of questions, I what, what you've just laid out nicely there. What do you want to have happen by the end of this call? Is something awful is going to happen? Like buyers are going to say, well, what do you mean? Why are you telling me that I need to tell you this at the start of the conversation when in reality, nothing nothing like that ever happens. It's no. just all this stuff we kind of think in our brain, like we can't control the conversation. Salesmen, salesmen are bizarre creatures because they will take a no, but they don't know it's a no. So they'll take a thinking over it and they'll chase someone and chase someone and chase. Deep down, they know it's a no, but they're happy with that. But the moment you say to them, hey, I'll tell you what, why don't you ask a question that could predictably give you a solid no? All of a sudden, the concept of a no becomes deeply offensive and they get incredulous. You can't do that. You can't. No, no, no. What if they say no? And, well, you could be losing an opportunity. Maybe, but you'll never know. But so you'd rather spend the next three months chasing someone, knowing it's a no, because you're too chicken shit to figure that out three months earlier. So no, yeah. it, it's it's all up here. It's the fear of hearing no that they've created. And I guess Ben, by asking, by saying these things up front, mm. we're actually giving our prospective client, um, the person that's reached out to us, more confidence. Suspect, that, suspect. suspect, suspect. Perhaps a bit more confidence in what we're doing because we're actually saying, look, um, what do you want to get out of this? And assuming you're happy with what I say, what happens now? Um, and then by the end of this call, one of these three things will happen. You'll um, you'll be happy to proceed, maybe, or I'll tell you that we can't help you, um, or you'll say that you're not comfortable with with working for us. For example, are you happy with that? And they're saying, well, salespeople never actually say this to me. This is this is a bit unusual for someone to lay down a, a conversation and kind of next steps and probably be taken taken back a bit because I know for damn well that when I'm speaking to salespeople, this never ever happens. No, I know that most of them are just so bloody grateful to be talking to a human being with a pulse. Um, <laughs> That uh, they'll, they'll talk because remember, most salespeople see telephone calls and things like that as some form of social engagement. They think it's an actual social event. What they don't <laughs> realize is, is that for the other person, this isn't Tinder. They have no interest in getting to know you on a personal, emotional level. So they don't see it as that. They see it as a purely functionary move. Whereas the salesman sees this as an opportunity to find a new friend and to build a wonderful, loving relationship with someone who, when they finally realize I can help them, will be a loyal, loving, patriotic customer for many, many years to come. No. They're just there to try and pump you for information before they decide what they want to do. Too right. Too right. Okay. So we've laid down this upfront groundwork or some call it upfront yeah. contract. Um, we've got, got the buy and we've established what the next steps are if, if applicable. 
Yeah. What are some um, What are some examples of some perhaps good discovery questions where we can really get out of um, the prospect that's reached out to us, Ben, and understand where they want to get to, what they're trying to do, and if we're actually going to be a, a good fit to help them and vice versa? Right. So uh, there's so much there. But obviously the yeah. rest of this call, the rest of this call, the purpose of this call is to make this person feel comfortable and believe that you know more about them and their problem than they do. That's it. And through this process, you will discover whether or not they do or don't have a problem. So I normally open with a question like, OK, well, look, let's pretend we decide we can and should work together. I'm not saying we will, but let's say that's the conclusion we come to. Let's look back a year from today or six months, depending on what it is that you sell, whatever the right time frame is. We're looking back a year. What will have changed or what will be different or what will have happened for you to say, man, I'm glad I chose to work with Benjamin. Paint the picture for me. Where do we need to go? Where do you need to get to? Okay. Yeah, I like that. So you're creating like a, a future world. Where well, we, we, know, we, want to know. we need hmm. to know, you know, if somebody's booking a holiday, you know, say, all right, well, let's start talking about airlines, shall we? Well, I know a lot of good airlines and they have wonderful planes. But the first thing is, uh, where do you want to go? Yep. OK, yeah. so where, where do you want to get to in a year's time? And I guess they'll just start talking then, won't they, Ben, about yeah, well, exactly I'll give you quite a lot of detail. Well, ideally, we'd like to be flippers, floppers or whatever they say. And I go, OK, yep. why? Okay. And all I do now is question them. And I also need to realize what I'm getting to is what was the trigger event? Because there may or may not be a trigger event. You see, if someone phones you up and says they're interested in talking to you about life insurance, hmm. one of the questions at some point that I have to weed in is, well, why now? Why, why now? Why now have you picked up the phone to ask about life insurance? What's happened in your world for you suddenly to realize that you need to insure yourself. Let's find out what that event is, because if that is compelling and powerful enough, we may have a chance. If it's oh, no reason, I'm just curious. Mm. Oh, I know probably not a lot's going to come. So there has to be a trigger event. If someone's reached out to you, what is it that motivated you? And then, well, why not six months ago? Why didn't you do the six? Well, because I, I, I hadn't been to the doctor and they told me I was dying. Okay, well, that makes sense. So now that you know you're dying, what do you want to do about it? Well, I want to insure myself. Well, maybe you've left it a bit late. You know, you know really, like most companies don't want to insure someone that knows they're dying. Oh, are you telling me you can't insure me? No, I'm not saying I can't. I'm just saying it might be very expensive. Oh, I didn't think of that. Well, well now you know. So what do you want to do? Well, I want to keep talking. Okay, well, let me ask some more questions to figure out if you're someone I could potentially provide life insurance to. Nice. Dig deep, dig, 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 dig deep. Okay, so, yeah, we're painting the picture. We're asking where they want to be in X amount of time. Um, yep. And like you say, they'll start telling the story. And then trigger event. So why, why have you reached out to me now? today? Why? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And is this getting buyers emotionally involved? Because we all have heard that buy, people buy emotionally and then justify it with, um, what's the old saying? Intellect. Justify it with intellect. Buy emotionally, justify intellectually. Exactly. So is, is that trigger event what's getting our buyer to open up, getting them emotionally attached to what we're saying, or is that a bit later in the, in the process? Well, I, I want to find out if there is any emotion here. Are, okay. they, are they simply on an intellectual fishing exercise, which they're well within their right to do, but if I establish that fairly quickly through my questions, then um, I may decide to qualify you out or tell you, you know what, it doesn't sound to me like you're ready for what we do just yet. Might make sense for you to phone back in six weeks when you've had your medical with the doctor. Yeah? And then what might happen is I'll start fighting you, you know, but I don't want to wait that long. Well, I'm going to be up front with you. I think you're doing this a little too soon. And if they argue with me that I'm wrong, they're buying into it. I mean, that's the easiest thing in the world. Yeah. So and how often, how often does that happen, Ben? When you're... Um... When you when you're asking these these questions and going through the process, how often when you say, "Look, I don't I don't think you're actually in a, in a right place to buy." Now. I think if we waited six months, you give me a shout back, then then we could probably help you. How often do you find that people actually say, "No, Ben, I, I really want your help now," or no, I, "I do want to do business." Into to the time, really. You see, because I, I I'm different. I'm tougher than most people because I realize very quickly that 
85 percent of people that contacted me on linkedin or, or or came direct through my website were wasting my time i, I charge a hundred pounds just to talk to me to decide whether or not we should have another chat okay. and 85 but and it worked because 85 percent of I get all these emails. Beans would really love your stuff. Watch you on YouTube. Be great to have a chat to see how you can help me and my team. And I always respond, absolutely would love to have one. Here's a link. Why don't you book yourself a consult call? And as soon as that's booked in, we can have that chat. And they all go great. And then I never hear from 85% of them. The 15% yeah. that go through and pay, 95% of them become a paying customer. So I, I, I can do this because I am my own business. So I can be brutal like that. So if you're an SDR or an AE, I don't even know one of those, and you can't do that as a company, then fine. You've got to have a better qualifying step. But for me, I can't be asked having chit chats with people that just want to chew my ear over, over you know, whatever. So by doing that, I eliminate 85% of people. So I know that if someone stumped up 100 quid to talk to me, the odds are they're probably serious about sales training. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Like yeah. you say, not, not everyone's in that position, but that's a good example. So I um, work with a young marketing guy, but a young guy like you, he's got his own digital agency, and he started charging forty pounds for people to have consult calls with him because he gets loads of leads to his website. And he said, "I can't talk to all these people, and most of them are rubbish." Start charging. All of a sudden, eighty percent of those interested just want to chat. Dry up. What was left ended up becoming clients. So it does work if you have the ability and the authority to do that. If you don't, then you have to figure out this first call is about figuring out, is there anything here or is this time wasting? And if one of these calls ever ends on, well, can you just send me a quote? Yep. Then the answer is no, because what they've demonstrated is they just want your quote. They're using you. And if you've got them to that point, and they still just demand a quote. A, you've probably done a bad job. Or if you've done a good job, you've come to the conclusion you're a tire kicker. Yeah, I want to get into that a bit more in a sec. Um, and whilst we're, Ben, well, Benjamin, whilst we're asking all these questions, whilst we're understanding where the, where the uh, suspect, prospect wants to get to, um, once we're trying to work out the trigger event, their motivations, um, why they've reached out to us. Should we be taking notes? Do you typically kind of write down everything that, oh, that you take hear? Notes, so you've yeah. got it all there? Of course, of course. Yes, no, no. You, I always have a pen and paper, except when I go sure. to a meeting. Um, and so I will be writing key points down. Now, if you know your world and what you sell, you know the things you need to make a note of and the things that you don't. So, yes, I can't tell people what they should take notes of, but you mm. need key things. So as I'm listening to a prospect, I'm listening to things they're saying and I'm making notes on things I'm going to come back to. Good. Okay. Yeah, so cool. once we've done these stages, Ben, um, I'll give you an example of some of the questions I ask when, when I'm talking to inbound leads. So let's say they've inquired about a website, for example. Okay. I might have, once I've done the initial parts that you've talked about, not quite in the same flow, I might say, look, people typically re reach out for me for a, a few reasons for, for a new site. Um, it might be that they want the website to showcase their services. It might be they want it to point existing prospects to, to build trust and confidence yeah. that they're a professional company to do um, some business with. Or it might be to actually convert visitors into inbound leads, into calls, into inquiries. Um, would you say it's any of these three or is it something else? Um, so I use common examples of why people do business with us at WebChoice. Watch text and see if one of them resonates. And yeah, and they might say, yep, yeah, it's one, two, and three. Yep, yeah, it's number two. Or and actually, it was something else. I want to build an e-com store. I want help with search engine optimization or something like that. So is that something that we should she should do as part of our offering? Understand it's the a common... Good way to get, it's a good way to get the uh, ball rolling. Mm. Uh, because remember, a lot of prospects will think they know what they want, but they don't. Because if they did, they wouldn't have to talk to you. So... Trying to find out what's what's what pain points or pain symptoms they have uh, is good. I mean, if someone said to me they wanted a new website, I, I, I'm a very simple guy and I ask very simple questions because simple questions are the easiest to remember and they're the ones that garner the most information. You've got to be like a curious five-year-old kid when you're talking to a prospect. So if someone said mm. to me, Benjamin, I'm interested in a new website, I'd say, why? Oh, well, we need a new one. Yeah, why? Now, people watching this will think, well, that seems stupid and dumb. And if you did that to me, I'd get annoyed. So a couple of things. Reality versus literal. This conversation, we're literally demonstrating 
you know what to do. But in the real world, it's done very differently. But I would say, if someone said, I need new words, I could, can I ask why you feel you need a new website? Well, we just feel our existing sites, you know, um, it's it's not performing. Okay, when you say not performing, can you help me understand what do you mean by not performing? Well, we just don't attract as many leads as we thought we would. Okay, well, tell me more about that. That's all I do. I've got to get them to paint the entire picture for me. And as I do this, they start to give me information. And as I'm hearing yep. the right things, I'm starting to think, I don't think it's anything to do with the website. The more I, it's, I don't, I think it could be SEO. I think it could maybe be the branding. They think it's the website because someone down at the pub they were talking to said it's probably your website. So my job is to get them to tell me everything that they don't think is relevant because prospects hold stuff back because they don't know what to tell you. So they don't tell you things unless you ask. And it's your responsibility to ask. So I know absolutely everything I want to get out of a prospect. If I don't get it, that's my fault, not the prospects. I can never say to the prospect, well, you never told me. Because the prospect will say, you never asked. Mm. Yeah, fair. Um, so is, is that what we call understanding their current state? So understanding what's going on right now. And yeah. I guess it's a bit like what we were talking about earlier. Um how did we get here? How are we here? You say you want a new website, but what does that mean? Why? And we dig deeper. Yeah, you know, well, we, we need to shift all the stock. What stock? We got a warehouse full of stock. Yeah, but you don't own the stock, right? No, no, I bought it, but not with your own money. You borrowed the money, right? No, 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 no. It's my own money. So you mean you've got, how much did you invest in this? Hundred. You mean you've got 100,000 pound of stock sitting in a warehouse that you can't shift? Yes. Okay, I can see why you need a website. But so what happens if you don't sell it? What happens to all that money? Well, I need to sell it. By when? So I just keep digging, 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 digging. The website isn't what he's buying. The website is the symptom. He, and he thinks it's the solution. What he's buying is knowing that he's going to be able to shift the stock. That's what he wants to buy. That's what he's got. So two, two points off that, Ben. When do we know if a problem's big enough that we can solve it and that we should solve it? After that, how can we move that on to our specific product or service when we actually want to say, great, we've got enough information. I can now start. I don't want to say pitching, but it is pitching Like no, what we can do. No, 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 no. So what we need to do is how do you know if you've got enough? Well, that's a judgment and a discretion in your industry. So mm. I know because I've managed to get the CEO or a managing director say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know enough times. So I know it's hard to pinpoint the exact moment, but it's not hard for me to know when I've got a prospect opposite me that clearly acknowledges they're in pain and they don't know how to fix it. That's where I want to get them. Yeah. So that'll be down to each individual and what they sell. Um, sure. And if you and if you're in sales now and you don't already know that, then you better start trying to figure it out pretty quick because this is this is the guts of our job. So ask your doctor, how does he know if his patient's sick? Well, I don't know until I meet the individual patient, but I certainly know the types of questions I need to be asking to figure out if someone is or isn't sick. So, yes, you will know. And if you don't know, why are you in sales? Yeah, fair enough. Um, so we've, yeah, of course, that goes, I guess there's a lot. There's various things to that, whether you're trained properly on the product service, how it typically helps people. There's a whole bunch of things. That could be another conversation. So we'll leave that for now. Um, and once we've, once we've got all the details we need, we've decided yep. they have got a problem that we can fix. Um, selling selling can be a funny game because it could be that we're selling something that's, we'll say, relatively low value, maybe in the hundreds of pounds, maybe in the thousands of pounds. And it might be that we can do the deal there and then on the phone call. Or it may be that we're selling something more complex. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when I'm selling kind of higher level websites or digital marketing strategies, then we have to organize a secondary call perhaps with other people that are involved in the process that need to be involved in the project. And we might even need to organize a presentation call after that. So have you got any ways, Ben, on Benjamin, on how we can actually decipher who's involved in the process, um, how we can understand if they've actually got money, um, and those, those kind of key things to, to understand? Well, ironically, it all comes down to questions, doesn't it? All that is information. Mm. And your job is to extract it from your prospect, knowing that like a reluctant dental patient, they don't really want to give it up if they don't have to. So your job as a salesman is to plant your feet 
and not take wishy-washy answers. The fear is your desire to be liked and to impress will overwhelm your desire to get to the truth. That is why so many salespeople drop out. So there are three things I want to know. Do you have a problem that I can fix or problems that I can fix? Second, do you accept that they need fixing? They've got to accept it needs fixing because if they don't accept it needs fixing, then we're all wasting our time. And thirdly, do you want to fix it? I need to know those three things before I move on. And if I get those three things, we know there's a problem that I can fix. We know we both agree it should be fixed. And I know why you want to fix it. You've convinced me that you will be fixing this problem. The next thing we say is, okay, well, now I know I can work with you. The next conversation we have to have is, can you afford me? Can you afford the solution? So before you present anything, you want to have a chat with them about, you do realize, I don't know yet because we're going to have to do a proper scoping exercise or whatever it is, but there's the potential from what you've told me in my years of experience in fixing these types of problems. You're looking at investing anywhere from 50 to, I don't know, 100,000 pounds. So, Mr. Prospect, do you have that amount of money to invest? Now, people are scared to ask that question because people think it's rude. Most salesmen have terrible money concepts and they don't like talking about money despite being in sales. It's very weird, but it's what your mother and dad taught you. It's rude to discuss money. It's rude to talk about things. So if you ask someone directly, do you have 50,000 pounds? The fear is, oh, well, they'll be offended. I don't care if they're offended. I'm more offended if they don't have it. Because is, otherwise, it, you're wasting my time. I know my solution's going to cost X amount. If you if you can't tell me you've got that put aside to invest in fixing this, then I ain't going to show you how to fix it. Why would I do that? That's dumb. Yeah. I mean, Benjamin, would you say that's the best way to, to go at it? So once you've had this detailed conversation, gone through the steps that we've just laid out, yeah. would you say, look, based on my experience and working with customers similar to yourself, I'd recommend this this product and it's you're going to be looking at around i don't know 15 to 20k let's say for well, example i wouldn't recommend sake. product at this stage okay no 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 not yet no no i'd say look let's pretend you see my solution see i never give them anything until i know i got all my ducks lined up yep so let's pretend you see my solution and let's pretend when you run it and you test it and you play with it and you hold it and you, you lick it you do whatever you want with it you're a hundred percent satisfied you believe that's the best thing since sliced bread. If we do this, our problem will go away. What will you do? And they're going to say, they'll say wishy-washy. They'll go, we, we'd probably buy. You see, probably. They chuck and they always, they always give themselves a get out of jail free card. So you have to challenge that. When you say probably, what do you mean? See, Salesmen don't like asking that question because they feel they're challenging the prospect. You're damn right I'm going to challenge the prospect. I ain't going to show you how to fix your problem only if you get to the inside. I kind of like it, but I'm probably not going to buy it. So what was the point of all of this up to this point? Oh, no reason. You, you wanted to do it. You're the salesman. I mean, I never asked you to do it. Oh, yeah, I suppose it is my fault. So if you see it and you like it and you believe it will fix your problem, what will you do? Because then I'm going to find out what they're thinking. Because then they'll say, well, in that case, we'll either buy. Or they'll say something like, well, we'd still have to go meet with other suppliers. Ah, yeah. so now I'm finding out what's going on here. Or we'd need you to tender. At which point you'd say, well, I don't tender, so it's over. Yeah, I'm not doing that. That's a waste of time. Yeah. Or, or something else. So you'll start to gauge how they're going to make their decision. And if they and I and then I'll challenge them. Well, I'm confused. If it does everything you want, and you could afford it, why would you not buy it? Well, because we need to meet with ABC Company first. And what are you hoping they're going to be able to say or do? Well, well, I don't know. Well, what if their product does exactly what ours does and it fixes it? How are you going to decide who to go with? Well, I guess. I, well, then it would come down to price. Ah, now we're getting to the nub of it. So would it be fair to say then that this decision is going to be based solely on price, regardless of solution? Now they start to wishy-wash because you kind of trapped them. 
So, yeah, your job is to challenge a prospect. They think nothing of using you. They think nothing of taking your knowledge and information and feeding it into their internal team to see if they can do it, of taking it to the incumbent and saying, look, I told you we were going to leave. Can you match this? Or taking it to market and setting up people against each other because they know all salesmen are desperate and they'll compete for their, their love like some sort of Greco-Roman gladiator jewel fest. So my job is not to get drawn into this ludicrous game. It's like, I know I can fix your problem. Convince me why I should help you. That's how I avoid all of this gameplay. And anyone in sales can do it. It just takes courage because you'll get a lot of no's with certainty. Salesmen don't like no's with certainty. They like think it over with hope. And, yeah, I mean, it's, it sounds like the root of this, Ben, is, is just constantly asking questions. So yes. you know exactly where this potential customer, this suspect is at. Yeah. Um, how can we harness this information to our advantage though? So say say you drilled right down and like you said there, the, the real issue was after you got to the crux of it, they're comparing, let's say, two or three vendors. Yeah. Um, and then you're saying, look, how are you going to decide once you've got these two or three vendors and, and it gets down to price? Where do we go there? Because a lot well, of us in sales... Well, give... you now, you're a grown-up, so you have to make a conscious choice. And the conscious choice is, am I going to get involved in a beauty parade in which the lowest is likely to win? That's, a, that's an active choice. No one forces you to do this. Salesmen feel they have to do it, but they don't. They choose to be treated in this manner. So if, you're, if you want to be treated like that, you'll probably go along with it. But if I've established that ultimately the deciding factor is going to be price and I know I won't be the cheapest, I'm not going to participate. It's no point. And then you get salesmen say, but, but, but what if? what if it's different this time i don't want to live in the world of what if i'm living in the world of certainty because the moment i say you know what guys i'm out they now have two choices what if they actually wanted me to win in the first place where do they go from here or yeah, I... if they get rid of me so quickly if they say well fine screw you we don't care I think you just answered my question anyway. You were never going to go with me. So uh, I can't lose. Certainty is your friend in sales. It just means you have to do more prospecting. The number one thing no one in sales wants to do. So they hold on for dear life. Do anything with a pulse. <laughs> too right. Too right. Um, so it sounds like a lot of this is, is being assertive. So knowing I'm when to. I mean, I'm, I'm blocked. <laughs> It's, yeah. it's, it's actually growing a pair and saying, I am worth more than what prospects treat me. I know I have a skill set and a knowledge base that can help people fix their problems. I know that. So I'm not here to justify my existence to someone who phones me up out of the blue and says, I'm really interested in having a chat with you. I'm not here to do that. You've come to me. Now I need to qualify you, qualify if you're suitable to be my next customer. That's it. It's not, I'm here to impress you. I'm not a dancing monkey. Let's, let's wrap things up. So let's say hey. we've, we've, um, we've, done, we've done all of our qualification. We've yep. decided they, we, we might have ruled them out, but let's say in this instance, they have got budget to work with us. They have got a problem that we can fix. We've got them emotionally attached with the trigger event. We've asked yep. all the right things yep. and they are, a, they are a qualified prospect. Um, and we've set this upfront agreement that we laid out right at the start and said these are the three potential outcomes that could happen yeah. by the end of this call. Do we wrap this up by bringing those back into play, Ben? No, what um, we do is we wrap it up very simply. Can I ask you a question, Mr. Prospect? Based on the questions I've asked and the answers I've given you during this phone call, do you believe I can help you? Now, if the answer to that is no, you've screwed up and it's over, isn't it? The other, answer no. <laughs> is, the other answer is, yes, I do. And then I go, why? And then they say what they're meant to say. Well, because you've asked, you know, all the right questions. It's quite obvious you understand our world and what we're talking about. Okay, so what do you want to do now? Well, you said the next step at the beginning would we'd have to blah, blah, blah. Okay, is that what you'd like to do? Well, I guess so. So it's not a no. No, it's not a no. And then they'll go, is it a no from you? And if you want to have fun, you go, I'm not sure yet. Could be. <laughs> Keep yeah. me going. Remember, um, you're in total control now. I like and it. And, and, yeah, let's do the next step. 
You go, fine. Well, this is what the next step is. This is what happens. You must do X, Y, and Z by A, B, and C, and I'll do B, G, and Y by C, D, and E. And then once we've completed that, I will then be able to show you the solution. At the end of it, you're going to say, all right, I'm in or I'm out. That's it. Mm. It's Good. about control. Sales is about controlling the process. You've got to remember that the person with the solution makes the rules, not the person with the money. That's a lie that you were told as a child. The man with the money, the man with the gold makes the rules. That is not true. Money only has value if someone's willing to give it value. If I don't want to sell you something you want or need, you suddenly realize how useless your money is. Mm. Yep. Yep. Okay. And yeah, so we've, we've wrapped it. We've wrapped it up nicely. You did mention this earlier earlier in our chat, Ben. Um, but if it gets to that stage and they've said, oh, can you send me a quote? Can you send me a proposal? Is that just a straight up no? Or is that a yes, you can? Well, but again, again, how, again, again, so it gets a bit nuanced here. I, at the beginning, would have told them the next step would be a quote or proposal. But I, I would attach a price tag to it. Happy to do a quote, but we charge £100 per quote. I've got a client, an IT client, and he charges two. He'll give a quote for £100 and he'll put whatever figure you want on it so you can go beat up your existing supplier. Or he'll charge you for a proper one where he'll come out and do a proper scoping exercise and give you the real quote. People love it. <laughs> yeah. Like it. Oh. You can now beat up your supplier. And it's, in the long run, it does him favors because if, if everyone starts taking these ludicrously low quotes to his competitors and they all start honoring them, they're going to be round long. Oh, oh dear. That's funny. Um, okay. Yeah. Now, what, one other thing. We, we've covered all this. Let's, let's cover one more thing whilst we're at it. Um, buyer's, buyer's remorse. So we've, um, let's say we're selling something that's quite transactional. Perhaps we can we can sell it over the phone, or we've had our, our call, and the buyers in principle, or the prospect in principle, has agreed to go ahead with us. Yeah. Um, how do we avoid a, a couple of days later, or a couple of weeks later, them saying, oh, "I've actually thought about it, and uh, I'm not quite ready to pay the invoice yet"? Or um, what's, sorry. Happened, what's happened there is, is you haven't done your job properly. So it's not hard to <laughs> convince someone by just bombarding them to capitulate and give in, which is how most people sell. It's funny, mm. most people say they aren't pushy, but actually they're just annoying people that do keep pushing. And so what happens is buyer's remorse is normally, because what's happened is is either they've bought emotionally, and uh, so the, the emotion could be feeling pressure, could be embarrassed, could be, it doesn't matter what the emotion is, but they buy, they just, all right, okay, I'm in, I'll do it. Then what happens is the rational brain, the intellectual bit goes away and says, hold up. Why did we just do that? Why, why, why did we agree to buy this? And what happens is, is once the intellect does its bit, it says there is no good intellectual reason to justify satisfying the emotion. So they phone you up and say, I've changed my mind. Or what happens is, is you intellectually bamboozle them. And intellectually, they just say, all right, yeah, all right, it makes sense. I'm in. But then they go away and they think about it. And the emotion says, but I don't want it. I mean, it makes sense but I don't want them. So what's happened is the salesman in that scenario has either sold to just the intellect and hasn't dealt with the emotion or he sold to just the emotion and hasn't handled the intellect. A good salesman sells to both and that prevents backouts. And I always say, I mean, I do this on a cold call. So I'll give you an example of a cold call to avoid a backout of a meeting. Sure. If I get the meeting and we get the date and the diary, I go, can I ask one last question? I go, sure. I said, you're not going to hang up the phone and think, oh, my goodness, what have I just done? I've booked an appointment with a sales trainer, are you? And they all go, no, no, no. I go, you sure? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm confident. Yeah, I, I, I want to do this. All right, because he had one last chance to back out. <laughs> so the way to avoid backouts is to give someone one last chance to back out. But if you haven't sold to both emotion and an intellect, the odds are someone will change their mind. And there's a quote. I don't know who said it. It's either Mark Twain or someone. A man mm. convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. So it's very easy to convince someone in the moment to change their mind, but deep down they haven't changed. So that's why buyer's remorse kicks in because the salesman actually hasn't done a good job. He sold to either intellect or emotion, but not both. You get both and both agree 
back out to slim. I love that. I love that last option. I used, I used to actually do that when I had to cold call quite a lot more. I used to give people the option to back out at the end. So if I was trying to set an appointment or set a Zoom call or whatever I was trying to get by the process of the meeting, I'd say, look, um, you do realize I'm a sales guy and you've got the option to back out at any time. Yeah. Um, do you want to back out now or should we carry on with it? And they'd, they'd usually laugh. They just, they'd find it yeah, quite funny and say, no, no, I don't want to back out. I do want to go ahead. I do want to do this. So they're actually reassuring you. I sometimes would say, you do realize that sales traders are like vampires. You can't rescind the invite. <laughs> Get the garlic bread up. Brilliant. Yeah. Ben, like, look, this, is, this has been class, mate. Really appreciate it. We've oh, gone over time, but I don't care. Um, I think this is a, a really good walkthrough for anyone that gets inbound leads of any capacity. So appreciate you coming on. Um, look, to, to wrap things up, we've, we've asked you the, the traditional question. Um, if you could thank just one person to, to come on. Um, who would you, who would you thank? But let's let's spin it. Um, if you could use just one channel to generate inbound leads, which one would it be, sir? For me, because I only use one, is oh, no, I use two actually. Uh, two. I use LinkedIn and YouTube. Um, okay. And I would say they're. Oh, I think I think they're kind of in some ways equal because obviously I do a lot on LinkedIn, so a lot of people have got to know me and my style. But also a lot of people have gone then onto YouTube and they've watched either the Mike Winnard interview, which is very popular, or they've watched me yeah. making prospecting calls. Um, and so it's a combination of the two. I think they, they, they complement each other. Um, and then after watching me, they go back and read more stuff and say, well, maybe he's not just a, you know, Mario brother looking idiot. Maybe this guy has something. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Cool, man. Well, look, Ben, um, thanks once again. Do there tell us, do you tell us how people can learn from yourself, how people can connect with you um, and anything you'd like to promote, sir? So obviously LinkedIn, uh, so you, you just find me under my name or UK's Most Hated Sales Trainer. Again, same with YouTube, UK's Most Hated Sales Trainer. I gotta, I, I'll, I'll do this. I don't have to, I'm having my first ever Christmas an, annual sale on the 1st of December for 24 hours. So I'm going to, like I said, I'm discounting because I can. And I'm discounting because I've done really well this year. And I'd like to give back to a lot of sales folk out there who often can't afford the full fees that I charge. So I'm going to have a 24-hour sale. I've got three boot camps up on offer. I'm going to put them at, um, well, I won't give away the percentage, but it's a big percentage off what you would normally pay. But I'm only going to do it for 24 hours because I want people to book on and make a decision. Great salesmen make decisions and act. So if you're going to procrastinate and dither, that's, that's not for you. So December 1st, keep an eye out on LinkedIn because it'll all be live there to book on. Yep. And I can wholeheartedly vouch for Ben's training. He actually um, helped me when I was building one of my sales processes a couple of years back. So it was an active part in, in me building up my own sales process. So if you're unsure about where to go or you're getting a lot of maybes or think overs, then uh, get in touch with Ben and uh, stop, stop messing about. Ben, cheers, man. You're most welcome, Sam. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, everyone. If you enjoyed the show, be, please do search Sam's Business Growth Show on your podcast channel of choice, where we interview business leaders each and every week to help you improve yourselves, grow your business and make best use of digital marketing. Thank you very much for tuning in. Are you tired of constantly hunting for new customers? You could be missing out on regular inbound opportunities, all because your website isn't on the first page of Google. Perhaps you're already spending lots of money on advertising, but your website is failing to convert all of your hard earned visitors into a consistent flow of new customers. If you'd like to learn more about our unusual approach that brings idle clients straight to you, connect with Sam Dunning on LinkedIn or book a free 20 minute consultation via webchoiceuk.com. That's webchoiceuk.com. Subscribe today for more digital marketing, sales and business growth tips from the experts.